Flowers for a Soldier. I think it's safe to say that the Second World War was the greatest event of the 20th century. It upturned the world. It caused the death altogether of 58 million people. 58 million. More even than the Spanish flu and the Black Death. There are people going around today who bear on their forearm the identification numbers tattooed by the Nazi guards in the concentration camps. Turn on the television, go to a bookshop, sit in a cinema. You still can't move for material about it. Like it or not, you have to live with it. You have to put up with Grandad, or more likely these days, Great Grandad, going on about it. What he did, what happened to him, where he went, what he saw, people he met, narrow escapes he had. It may be a yawn to young people listening, but you have to remember that it was not a yawn to him. He lived through the greatest event of a whole century. It would be amazing if it had not made a mark on his life. He can't help it. That is what it made him. That is what he is. Perhaps what is really amazing is that the people who did not live through the Second World War are still hypnotized by it. Not only the old cultures, everyone else. There is even now no shortage of material to feed their curiosity. Government documents are released, secret hiding places are discovered, bits of spitfires are dug up, private papers and photographs are discovered in the lofts of dead pensioners. And still the stories come. Some, of course, are awful. Some are funny. Some are sad. Some are touching. Some are inspiring. Some are nearly unbelievable. And some don't fit into any category. <clears throat> Here's one from Exmoor, North Devon. You wouldn't think that the war would reach out into the back of beyond like North Devon, but it did. It is about an American army camp up on Exmoor in the Brendan Hills. It may be a mite difficult to take in now, but in the, in the preparation for D-Day, the liberation of Europe, there were American army and air force camps all over the south of England. Anyway, near this camp, in a small cottage, lived a man who worked for the local council, looking after the roads. He didn't go to the camp, he wasn't allowed, but of course he knew about it. One day he heard that two American soldiers, GIs they were called, two American soldiers had died there. Young men, healthy, well-trained, fit, but they had died. Pretty unusual. Nevertheless, the army had a method for dealing with these sad events. They put the bodies in temporary graves, and at the end of the war, they would have the coffins dug up and transported back to the United States, to, place, to the place where their families lived, and they would be given a permanent resting spot. It was common practice. The roadman could not get these two young soldiers out of his mind. He thought constantly how lonely those graves must be on the edge of a military camp up in the Brendan Hills, thousands of miles from their grieving families, grieving especially for sons who were so young. One day he picked some flowers from his garden and went over to the camp. At first, of course, the sentries suspected him. What was a stranger, a civilian at that, doing hanging round the secret army base? He was taken to some officers and told to explain his business. But when he did and showed the flowers, everything changed. He was escorted to the graves and allowed to lay them. The story spread fast. The road man was invited to come back whenever he wanted to lay some more. When he did, he was met with smiles all round the camp. This went on for quite a while. The road man became a familiar face to everyone. When the war came to an end, 
The officers told him when the coffins were to be moved and flown back to the United States. The roadman went to work again. When the coffins were placed on the plane, there was a bunch of Canterbury bells from the roadman's garden resting on each of them. And that was not the end of the story. After the soldiers had left Brendan, an American officer approached the roadman and told him to dig in a certain spot on the local common near the camp. He did, and unearthed a tin containing money and a Bible which had belonged to one of the dead soldiers. Later again, he received a message asking him to call at the trustee savings bank in Taunton. He did that too, and found that an account had been opened in his name with a hundred dollars in it. There was a note. It said that the money was an expression of thanks from the unit to which the dead soldiers had belonged. And that was not the end either. A short while afterwards, the roadman received a parcel from the parents of one of the dead soldiers. In it was a letter of gratitude and a gold watch. It was still not the end. The roadman had not known the soldiers' names when he first laid the flowers. It turned out that one of them had the surname Farmer. The roadman's name was Ernest Farmer. They did some research and discovered that some of Ernest Farmer's ancestors had emigrated to America, and their descendants and the roadman were distantly related. Two years after the war, the American Mr. and Mrs. Farmer came to England, and they visited Ernest Farmer in his roadman's cottage. So a family was reunited, all as a result of two tragic early deaths, and all because a kindly man had picked a bunch of flowers. That is a very strong hint, isn't it? If a kind act occurs to you, it's usually worth doing it. Bye.